Yes, so I, I being recorded. So, uh, yes, so my initial understanding of the task was to talk about serologic testing. And uh, you mentioned management just now, and I, I will weave my uh, comments about serologic testing uh, into thoughts about treatment in, in a way that I think will become very clear and hopefully be uh, helpful to you. I didn't think I could do a talk on serologic testing as it relates to evaluation and management and then go into all the other nuances of management, including some of the controversies, though I'm delighted to do that later. So with that having been said, here are my uh, disclosures, There's some but not most of which relate to ongoing activities in hepatitis B. There's a lot of fatty liver disease in here and some involvement in COVID studies as well. Now, I believe passionately in the notion that to understand hepatitis B virus as a clinician, including aspects of initial evaluation, diagnostic testing, and management, you have to understand the virus. And I will readily admit that what got me passionate about hepatitis B was a wonderful lecture by uh, a young fellow in infectious disease at UCSF in 1980 named Don Ganim, who Bob and perhaps others will know, became a very famous virologist. I was an intern and he delved at that time in our noon lecture for house staff into what we then knew about the biology of hepatitis B. And I just thought it was so fascinating that that fascination has never abandoned me. So I'm going to impose my belief that to understand the virus, to understand the disease, you have to understand the virus. And this is the best picture that I've ever found online uh, from the organization you see at the bottom of the uh, structural uh, layout of hepatitis B virus. I, I, this almost looks like a coronavirus with those large surface protein uh, pieces sticking out, but this is not spike protein. I, I wish we had all never had to have heard of spike protein uh, because it's a curse around us now. But hepatitis B virus uh, also has you know, outer, an outer coat with a protein called the hepatitis B surface antigen, which exists in a small, medium, and large form, as you see depicted. And I'll work from the outside in here. We then have an inner protein, which is vital to the structural integrity of the virus called the core protein. And I hope you can see my arrow. If you can't, let me know. So that's the core protein. I, I tell my lay patients that it's sort of like a, the outer wall of the castle, a little moat in between, and then the inner wall of the castle, inside of which is all the really important stuff, like this very interesting partially double-stranded DNA molecule and a protein associated with it that's carried within the nucleus inside the core protein called the DNA polymerase that clearly is responsible for directing the replication of the virus's genetic material. In the mode here, we have graphically depicted a protein called the E antigen, which I'd like you to think of as the secretory counterpart of the core protein. And in ways that I'll show you in a moment, the E antigen is derived from much the same portion of the viral genetic code or genome as the core protein, but it's the secretory counterpart. So core is not expressed in blood, at least not in significant amounts. E antigen is the counterpart to the core protein that is expressed in blood. And some chronically infected patients express E antigen, some do not, and we'll go through that too. This is an old but classic picture of one of the first uh, attempts at visualization of hepatitis B virus when it was first becoming known in the 1960s and 70s showing a Dane particle here named after Professor Dane who first did this, which is a kind of a, a double shelled particle. You can see that there's an outer protein, inner protein, the surface and core proteins respectively. And then a vast excess of filamental, filamentous as well as spherical objects, which represent different forms of the surface antigen. When you get hepatitis B vaccine or give it to a patient, you're giving a product that's purified by recombinant technology, not taken from plasma for the last four decades of pure spherical particles of hepatitis B surface antigen. This is a beautiful picture of the life cycle of the virus from Professor Lacronini, a very famous virologist in Australia who unfortunately for all of us just retired, but he's still very much with us and intellectually as keen as ever and one of his colleagues, Peter Reville. And what we start with is the virion floating around in somebody's bloodstream, wanting to get into a liver cell to infect it. And in 2012, a very important discovery was made of something called NTCP, which is the bile acid receptor in the human body, or at least the major one that has to do with entirely different physiologic purposes besides letting a virus in, 
But this virus has adapted very cleverly to using our own bile acid receptors to enter cells, whereupon it gets uncoded, releasing this double-stranded or partially double-stranded genome that enters the nucleus through little openings called nucleopores. The human polymerases complete this single strand here so that the whole thing is now double-stranded like our own DNA is. And that gets coiled up into a structure called covalent closed circular DNA, which actually ends up forming a very stable mini chromosome, so to speak, that belongs to the virus and that sits alongside your own chromosomes uh, in the nucleus of liver cells. Now, that CCC DNA, like all DNA, ultimately exists to get transcribed into messenger RNA, of which there are five in the case of this virus, and these get exported out to the cytoplasm of the cell where they get translated into various proteins of the virus. And one of those proteins is called the core protein shown here, which forms a capsid structure consisting of something like 120 of those molecules in a, in a, a casohedral form, forming what's called a nuclear capsid. And one of the important, all the import, all the viruses, uh, all the viral RNAs, I should say, are important, but probably the central one that occupies us most is something called the pregenomic RNA, which is a full strand of the genome in RNA form. And that gets incorporated into one of these nuclear capsids. And without that incorporation into a full capsid, the virus cannot replicate its genetic material. So that encapsidation process is very, very important to the ongoing life cycle of the virus. Well, this virus is very interesting because it gets translated from RNA to DNA, which should remind many of you of retroviruses. And it may be no accident that some of the same drugs that work very well against HIV, the quintessential retrovirus in our lives, also work against hepatitis B. There are some, we think, ancient biologic similarities between these two major classes of otherwise very disparate viruses. And uh, the uh, virus uh, goes ahead and replicates, making new DNA from the RNA. And the new DNA can either exist in this partially double-stranded form that I've already told you about that gets incorporated into a whole virion with envelope protein consisting of the surface antigens shown here coming from the Golgi apparatus. But a little bit of it is so-called sub is subject to so-called mispriming and forms a linear structure. And that's how the virus integrates some of its DNA into your own chromosomes if you're a patient with especially chronic hepatitis B infection. We'll have a little more to say about integration shortly, but it's a very important life cycle of the virus. It is a part of the life cycle. It is a replicate of dead end. So whole virus can't be made from integrated DNA. Currently, we think that the only viral protein that can be made from integrated DNA is the surface protein. Well, the some scientists think that a truncated version of a mysterious protein, becoming less mysterious to be sure, called the X protein, can also be made. The main thing that bothers clinicians about this integration is we think that that is part of the pathogenesis of how these patients can be subject to liver cancer, aside from also the capacity to get cirrhosis, which in itself can cause liver cancer, independent of viral mechanisms. But we think this integration is a, a very bad thing for infected patients. The E antigen, as I've said, is the secretory counterpart of the core protein, gets secreted into the blood. We'll talk in a moment about certain mutations that can occur in that part of the genome that stop the production of E antigen, but unfortunately don't stop the virus in its tracks from doing everything else it wants to do, like replicate and cause liver disease. The categories of chronic HPV-infected patients include E antigen positive patients and E antigen negative patients. And I would say that a majority of the patients in our practices these days are E negative. We'll have a little more to say about this distinction shortly, but suffice it to say that most patients early in their course of chronic hepatitis B are E antigen positive, which is uh, almost tantamount to saying they have high levels of viral replication and often active liver disease, although if they're in the so-called immune tolerant state, they may not have active liver disease, and more about that in a moment. A cherished moment in the life of a patient is when they have what's called a spontaneous seroconversion, where they lose the E antigen, become E antigen negative, usually E antibody positive, and that's a state of viral quiescence. The immune system of those patients has by itself 
surmounted the problem of arresting viral replication by immunologically controlling the virus. And these patients therefore have inactive liver disease and normal liver enzyme levels. But another group of patients can transition to what's called E antigen negative chronic hepatitis, where they also have viral replication, although in a somewhat lower degree than the patients who are E positive, and they can have just as active liver disease as the worst E antigen positive patients, or they can have relatively inactive disease, particularly if they have low levels of the virus. And you notice there are transitions in both directions uh, amongst some of these phases. An open reading frame of uh, any genome is um, are, are portions of the genome that contain DNA sequences between start and stop codon. So uh, genes are made from open reading frames. And this virus is one of the most uh, simple in terms of how economically it's packaged with only four open reading frames in nature. And these open reading frames together account for the capacity of the virus to produce that surface antigen that we talked about, the surface protein, the DNA polymerase, which we mentioned, the X protein, uh, and then the core portion of the genome, which has a pre-core portion as well as a core portion, as you see in a moment. So this part of the genome, this open reading frame, is the source of both the structurally vital core antigen and the non-structural, as I keep saying, E antigen. And this is a beautiful old slide that illustrates the difference between core antigen and E antigen. And it all has to do with the fact that that open reading frame actually contains two start codons when it gets made into protein. The first one spans obviously a larger portion of that genomic sequence, but the second start codon results in the production of a shorter protein, and that's the structural core antigen. But if the process starts here at this start codon, the resultant peptide sequence is cleaved at both ends and reconfigured so that it forms the E antigen, that secretory counterpart to the core protein. And there are two things that can happen in this open reading frame that can make a patient with chronic hepatitis B no longer able to make the E antigen, but still happily make its core protein plus all the other things it needs to make infectious viral particles that can do all the damage that E positive virus can. And those two things are first a very well characterized substitution in what's called the 1896 position of this part of the genome that result in a stop codon, an instruction for the, uh, this part of the sequence to stop being read. And therefore, E antigen literally can't be made anymore because it requires translation of this whole area. The other equally important thing that can happen is that this pair of, position, this pair of positions right here, the 60, 1762 and 64, if mutated in a certain way with regard to each of those two positions, forms the classic basal core promoter, mutations. And as a pair, they sharply, they don't stop, but they downregulate the production of E antigen. So this is responsible. These two mutations or sets of mutations together or singly can uh, both account and do both account for the vast majority of patients who have E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B who we see. And I'll be coming back to this distinction between E positive and E negative patients repeatedly, which is why I always like to start my lectures with this explanation. Let's put on our clinical hats for a moment to look at the typical serologic course of acute and chronic hepatitis B infection. Remember that infants who are infected, say from infected mothers, unfortunately don't have the immune capacity to clear the infection. And these are uh, infants who generally become chronically infected for life uh, at a risk of over 90%. And this accounts for a large part of the population of hepatitis B infected patients around the world, uh, maternal infant or, or early familial trans transmission, particularly in infancy or early childhood. In adults with competent immune systems, on the other hand, only about two to 5% fail to clear the virus. So very, very different settings in which the virus is far more or less likely to just cause acute infection or transition to chronic infection. In acute infection, the uh, expression of the infection is heralded in the patient's blood by the early appearance of surface antigen followed shortly thereafter by the hitherto discussed E antigen. Total core antibody appears a little later than the surface antigen, and that's when the ALT elevations start to rise which is tantamount to reminding you that it's really the immune response to the virus, not the virus itself, that causes the liver damage that we call acute or chronic hepatitis B. 
the moiety of antibody to core that is most predominant in the early stage, as in any viral infection, is the IgM. And that becomes an important diagnostic test, as I'll repeat again in a moment. The IgM pre clears pretty quickly, and in patients with self-limited infection, the surface antigen clears quickly, and you're left with anti-core antibody, later purely IgG antibody, as a permanent marker of infection. After a window period here between the clearance of the surface antigen and the appearance of surface antibody, surface antibody indeed appears, and these two serve as a permanent marker that you once had hepatitis B. Note the transition very early in these acute patients from E antigen to E antibody. In contrast, surface antigen by definition persists indefinitely in people who develop chronic hepatitis B. And in most patients, the E antigenemia persists for weeks or months or even years, sometimes indefinitely. But for the reasons I discussed earlier, the virus either can become quiescent due to immune control, whereupon you clear the E antigen, a very important moment in the life of the patient in a beneficial sense, or the patient can transition, perhaps after an interim period of inactivity, to E negative chronic hepatitis B, as I explained it before. Uh, these are the different phases of chronic hepatitis B, showing that early on, particularly in infants born to infected mothers, much more than in people who get this in their teenage or early adult years, uh, infants go through an immune tolerance state that generally lasts for a couple of decades, highly permissive to viral replication because the immune system isn't responding, as I mentioned before, and these patients have sometimes astronomical HPV DNA levels, high levels of surface antigen, but low levels of ALT with no inflammatory activity in the liver because of the absence of the immune response that causes the problem in the first place. Now, I prefer to call the next phase the immune active rather than clearance phase, although in many sources, it continues to get called what you see here. And here you can have fluctuating levels of viral DNA, ALT flares that can come and go or perhaps persist throughout the duration of years that the patient is immune active is quite variable. Gradually, the surface antigen, although all too gradually, the surface antigen levels decline. And then you go into the inactive carrier state if you're lucky or if you've been treated with effective medications, potentially followed by reactivation with E-negative disease related to those sets of mutations I discussed. I'm not gonna dwell on this in detail. We all know what the potential terrible outcomes of this infection are. But I would emphasize that we think there are two pathways to liver cancer in chronic hepatitis B. One is via cirrhosis, which is the classic pathway to cancer in people with liver disease of any kind that's culminated in cirrhosis, whether viral or not. But you can also transition from chronic hepatitis B without cirrhosis to liver cancer. And this distinguishes hepatitis B from most other types of liver disease. And that's when you get into that whole issue of viral integration that I outlined for you earlier in the slide on the life cycle. If you're a clinician seeing a patient who's jaundiced and feels sick and you suspect acute viral hepatitis, these are the markers that you should get. It's a package of four traditionally. Lately, we've added a test for the increasingly, slightly increasingly common hepatitis E virus. Sometimes you wait till the second round of testing to do this one. But most importantly, you get a surface antigen test. You get that IgM anticore, an IgM antibody to hepatitis A, and not just a hep C antibody, but you have to remember that hep C antibody may not appear till 12 weeks or so. So you have to get a PCR for HCV to catch it early. Now, what do we do if a patient tests positive for surface antigen? Obviously, we've probably already gotten the liver panel, but that's important. We test for the E antigen antibody. We get a viral level. Hepatitis B genotyping is optional, and I'm going to leave that to the Q&A if you'd like to pursue that. Hep D antibody, Dr. Gish has been very passionate about trying to get the liver and physician communities around the country and around the world to do a one-time test for hepatitis D or Delta in any patient with chronic hepatitis B. I, for one, certainly agree with him and don't need any convincing. And if you do happen to get a hep D antibody test that's positive, you have to confirm viremia with an HDV RNA test by PCR. It's a good idea in a chronic B patient to check for hep C. We do a baseline AFP imaging, and we do a non-invasive test generally called ultrasound elastography or fiber scan to assess for the degree of fibrosis, if any. This is a nice slide that just summarizes the different serologic patterns of the main markers, surface antigen, core antibody, IgM anticore, and antisurface. And if you have no markers, you're obviously susceptible to infection. If you have both core and surface antibody, you once had infection. If you only have core antibody, excuse me, surface antibody, you've been vaccinated, 
Um, if you have surface antigen and you have IgM anticore, note the anticore total is present also, you have acute B and chronic B patients have surface antigen and anticore, but they've lost the IgM expression, which only occurs early, and they generally don't have surface antibody, although some patients may. And I get asked a few times a year, doctor, what do I do with my patient who has both surface antigen and antibody, but otherwise looks chronic? And the answer is you can have some surface antibody and it doesn't really change anything about the disease or how you would manage it. And then we have our fascinating patients who are only anti-core positive for whom there are several possible interpretations, but most commonly they have resolved infection. What you have to remember about these patients they may have very low levels of HBV DNA, and that's called a cult HBV infection. But even if they don't, they do harbor some residual CCC DNA molecules from which reactivation can occur under certain extreme conditions, most notably profound immunosuppression with the drug like rituximab, which is a CD20 antagonist that's used for lymphomas and certain inflammatory diseases. And if you don't note this before you treat patients with such drugs, or if they're getting stem cell transplants and are going to be profoundly immunosuppressed, you may end up dealing with a whopping reactivation that can be fatal, actually. Now, how do we interpret our understanding of the serologic markers with treatment algorithms? Well, this is the ASLD guidance on hepatitis B therapy, and you'll note that they and every other guidance in the world distinguishes between E-positive patients and E-negative patients and, and now we understand that distinction hopefully a little bit better uh, if, if this wasn't known to you before. And the SLD guidance people continue to say that the only clear-cut treatment candidates who you should treat right away are those with viral DNA levels of above 20,000 uh, things called international units per mil and an ALT of more than twice normal. People like Dr. Gish and me feels that this is antiquated and that we should be much more expansive about our treatment uh, criteria the ASLD doesn't necessarily do, say don't treat the others, but they qualify it in many ways, like wait for a while in some patients or treat them right away only if they have a lot of inflammation or fibrosis or both sort of gray zone patients who dominate this picture. The only difference in the E-negative patients is that they say, okay, go ahead and treat people with DNA levels above 2,000 instead of 20,000, but they still have this, I think, archaic ALT more than twice normal. I hope I'm not offending anybody on the call but I'm being very blunt. And I don't think Dr. Gish disagrees, but he can comment later. Some of us have uh, together formed a group and have published something that's come to be called the US algorithm, which incorporates both evidence-based medicine and opinion for five renditions now. This is the one that was just published online under the leadership of Paul Martin. I was privileged to be the senior author. We make it simple. We say HBV DNA more than 2000, elevated ALT, Forget all the hand waving about whether there's fibrosis or inflammation. Any elevation in ALT warrants therapy in a patient with the DNA above 2000. So we keep it very simple. And I, there are even some folks who might be more expansive than this. It's important to understand that. Just uh, noting time here for you. Yeah, a couple more minutes. Uh, almost done. Treatment endpoints also have to understand the serologic markers. Again, we divide into E positive and E negative. If you are an E-positive patient on nuke therapy and you don't lose E, you have to continue or viremia will relapse. We have ongoing arguments. If you lose E antigen, whether you stop 12 months later or later than that, I wait three years because I think that helps prevent recurrent viremia a little bit. And we don't stop in cirrhotics. The classic teaching in E-negative patients is to treat indefinitely if there's no surface antigen loss. Now, a lot of folks seem to be in a rush to stop, even if they still have surface antigen, because there is some evidence that that can actually hasten the clearance of surface antigen. And this is a beautiful paper that just came out is in gastroenterology showing that in the long term, after four years in people who stopped nukes with complete viral suppression for a few years, only 13% ultimately lost surface antigen. But you can identify who they might likely be with a newer test that we have now called quantitative surface antigen testing that actually gives you the number of units of that protein in the blood. And you can see that for Caucasian patients, in Asian patients, they propose below 1,000 IU per mil at the time you're thinking of stopping therapy, or for Asian patients, less than 100, is giving the patients a reasonable chance to clear subsequently. But you have to always tell patients there's a risk of a flare if the virus comes back, and it can be particularly dangerous in cirrhotics. Looking to the future, we're hoping that the next big leap forward is to functional cure where we clear surface antigen. We still don't know how we're going to clear CCC DNA and certainly integrated DNA. So right now, we're just talking about this with all these novel trials going on. 
And I just wanted to close with one last comment, which has to do with the recent discovery that the surface antigen that you see in our E-negative patients, getting back to that distinction between E-negatives and positives, is coming from integrated DNA, according to recent scientific data, while in E-positives, it's still mostly coming off the CCC DNA. So as patients go on with their infections over the years and become E-negative, there's a shift in the manufacturing facility for most of the surface antigen. And I'm just telling you this to underscore the challenge that faces us in the future if we start thinking about, well, how are we going to clear integrated DNA? CCC DNA, maybe, that's hard enough, but what about integrated DNA? Two very quick comments about two new potential markers, HPV RNA, which may serve as a marker of CCC DNA activity or actual levels, and something called the correlated antigen. And I've run out of time to go through this in any more detail, so thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacobson. Um, just a note, uh, please type your questions in the chat or raise your hand so I can um, be sure to flag you. But we did get a question in the comment or in the comment box that was asking um, about the percentage of patients who have spontaneous seroconversion. If you could speak to that. Right. So we always have to define which seroconversion we're talking about. The question may be about E antigen seroconversion. E antigen positive patients clear, according to the literature, in about 10% per year. And that's why, for example, the ACLD guidance says, well, if you have a patient without such a high viral level or a ALT that's only slightly elevated, you know, you might want to wait for six months unless they meet their very strict criteria of ALT more than twice normal, because maybe they're in the process of seroconverting. Most of the patients are actually not in the process of seroconverting. So I personally don't delay therapy, but 10% is the answer and clearance of surface antigen about 0.5 to 1% per year in untreated patients. Thank you, a really helpful. And I wonder, are you comfortable with us sharing your slides? Because I think you have a lot of great resources for some of our providers um, attending today. Yes, I don't think any of these are particularly proprietary, so I'd be delighted to share the slides with people. Okay, great, thank you so much. We'll be sure to include those in the follow-up notes. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? All right. All right. I will now turn it over to our 